All right, everybody, this is a live stream where I wanted to talk to you for a little bit about how to get involved with all this right to repair stuff. I'm kind of bummed out because I am here in Rochester, New York at home, and I want to be on my way to Maine to go testify at one of these fun public hearings about the right to repair that's happening tomorrow. And instead of being able to do that, I decided to stay home and make this video to inspire you to go to that hearing or any of these other ones in my stead. So let's talk about how do you actually get involved? Why is this important? And we'll answer any questions that you have about right to repair. So I wanted to give you some talking points as we go. But first, it seems like, you know, here goes Lewis, he's in Washington, he's off at, a, at one of these hearings, or here goes Jessa in Boston. How do you find out about this stuff? What is it and what's going on? So if you're not from the U.S., this is a set of laws that, are, that have not been voted on, they haven't been voted up, they haven't been voted down, they haven't gone anywhere, that have been introduced at the level of the state in, I think, about 20 different states in the United States. So this is not federal legislation that applies to everybody in the U.S. We're talking about individual states are deciding what are they going to do about supporting repair for electronic devices in, that are sold in that state. And each bill is a little bit different. So that's why you're, we're, we're right, going around to all, all of these different states. My home state is the state of New York, and we're active there, but we also go out and try to make our voice heard and inspire you to get involved in your home state. So how does it work? First of all, you got to figure out um, what is the bill in your state and read it, form an opinion about it. So reading the bill, I think, is really important and making your voice heard. So how do you go about doing that? So let's start here. The easiest place to get started is to go to repair.org. So repair.org is largely a group of volunteers. So I don't want to hear any, we don't like how this is being run. It's completely run by volunteers. That means you. So you are just as capable of running the right to repair stuff as anybody else. Jump in, jump in and, uh, and add your skills. So here we are at repair.org. If you've never been here, join up and join the mailing list and let them know where you're from so that you can get emailed or uh, communication from repair.org whenever things are, are going on. Here is a really great place to start. Tell your legislators to support the right to repair. So they've done a fantastic job to make it really easy for you to contact your state legislator, right? So we can click New York and it's time to speak out and tell your story. This is going to make a little form for you to, to reach out to your actual representative. And those guys, in my experience, they really do want to hear from the people that vote for them. They want to hear from their own constituents and represent them. All right, so next, uh, how do you know whether or not there's even a, you know, what does the law look like or the bill look like in your state? So next place I'm going to show you is this thing, Legiscan. So I've been finding out about these hearings pretty randomly, where just somebody Somebody, uh, you know, drops me a note and says, hey, what about this? And I think that's kind of what's going around because they're scheduled kind of randomly. So here's the one in Maine, for example. You can go to Legiscan and you can search by state. And I just searched for the text for the word repair. I'm not sure if you can see that or not. That might be behind my head. <laughs> there you go. Yeet! <laughs> so you can search here in the search box and then click search and it will find um, bills that have the word repair in it. So this one here, hey, look at that, an act to ensure a consumer's right to repair electronic products. That's what we're talking about. This is the right to repair legislation for Maine. So insert your state and you can find out what the current bill looks like. So here we can go to, let's click detail. And now we're looking at the bill that's up for a public hearing tomorrow in Augusta, Maine. So if you're from Maine, get in the car, go to Augusta and have, have a lot of fun. Um, you get to meet Lewis and you, know, you can uh, and let your voice be heard. It's really, really a great experience um, to do. So let's see. What do you do next? You're going to look at the text of the bill. Now, that can feel like overwhelming, like, oh, I'm not going to read a bill. But guess what? They're super short. They're like two pages, right? 
Here's the one over here for Maine in an in a easy to read format. So it is short. It's just definitions and then the bill. That's it, done. You can read that and then you can form a valid opinion so that you know you're actually discussing the facts and make your voice heard. All right, um, next, what do I wanna talk about here? Uh, joinrepair.org, the mailing list, and then find out when the public hearings are. So for this one, we can figure it out because it tells us on Legiscan that this, where, where was that, detail summary? Yeah, here we go, look at this, you can see it right here. There's a hearing on January 23rd, that's tomorrow at 101 in wherever the cross building is, room 202, be there. That's how you figure out where to go, right? So those are, those are the next two things. Um, so now, uh, what should you do? You should, in your state, go talk to your representative. That's the absolute best thing you can do. And the best time to do that is not when they're at the state house and really busy trying to prioritize which is the most important things to talk about and work on for this season. It's best to kind of do it, you know, later or in the, in the summer off, you know, <laughs> some other time back at home, your representative lives in your community. Go find them, make an appointment and go talk to them and just tell them your story and what repair means to you. They are, that is their job to listen to you and they seem to, to really like that. That's what they're there for. So go talk to them. If you can't go talk to them, then call them. If you can't call them, fax them. And then last is the lame email or one of these canned forms from repair.org. But just go out and connect with these people. Invite them to your shop. You know, the, like we have done that and it's fantastic to just get to know your representatives. All right, next. Now, when you're in a meeting, either at one of these public hearings where you have written, okay, I'm going to testify, and that's a, you know, scary kind of thing to do. It seems all formal, but relax. It is part of being American, and it's really fun to experience that. So let's give you some talking points, some things to focus on, and that's really the, the point of this video, talking points. All right, so when I, I've gone to a lot of these, and as I sit there and I think about what I would feel if I was the representative, and I'm listening, and I hear a lot of the, the proponents, the people, the repair people, the, the DIY people, I hear them say this a lot. You know, I repaired this for this guy, I repaired that for that guy, and I saved him so much money. And I really start, I would start to think if I were them, well, it sounds like you can repair a lot of stuff already, why do you need legislation? So answer that question. That is what I think, this season at least, is what's most important. Help the legislators to understand why we actually need rules. Why do we need them to get involved when it looks like a lot of people are fixing stuff anyway? Right? Answer that. And the answer to that as far as what I want them to know, what I think is important, is for them to understand the risk of serialization and how serializing parts and marrying parts to a device is really dangerous. So that's talking point number one, is for them to understand that while we can repair a lot of things today, there is a lot of dangerous precedent that's being set that we can see software locks that are locking down components. Ask them, how would you feel if your remote control for your TV, the battery, the little AA batteries, what if you couldn't change them out because they had a read-only number in the battery that was paired to your remote. That would suck because then you'd have to buy a new TV every time the batteries died. That's what's going on with, uh, with phones. And I wanna show you this example so that if you maybe are new to this industry that you can really understand that. So I'm gonna show you right here so that you can understand and maybe you can make an example just like this. If you're in a small group meeting Remember, this stuff is not decided at the public hearings. This stuff is decided in the lobbying meetings when you go there and you sit and you talk to them as, uh, without a three minute timer. So take something like this demo so that they can understand. So what I have here in front of me is, uh, let's see, let me get, ah. All right, this is live, so I, I'm monkeying around. I've got two phones here and both of these phones uh, those, these phones are, are both on. So let me 
wake them up. And these phones are both here for repair. One of them, interestingly, I was just reading the note. It's this one that said they have Apple Care, and they were told, and this is so typical, you know, on all over my channel, they were told that there was no hope for their data and that there was no way that you could do anything other than just turn in the phone. All right, so here's both of these phones. Now, I want to call your attention to this battery health stuff. This is an iPhone 10, and this is an iPhone 10s. So with the iPhone 10 and every phone before it, battery health would talk to any battery that you put in. So if you plugged in a battery of any, any iPhone 10, whatever, any iPhone battery, the battery health software would talk to the battery. Now it still does talk to the battery in the 10S, but it tells you that it doesn't, that's a software lock. So let's show you this example. So what I have in here is a um, battery and you can see that the software in this iPhone 10 is talking to the battery and we can read battery health, maximum capacity, 100%. And I can even see like this little graphs of some usage. This iPhone 10 has no problem talking to this exact battery and reporting on the battery health. Now watch what happens when I take that battery and I put it into this iPhone 10s. This 10s is talking to the battery that's in here right now, which is its native battery, and it can clearly talk and see the same information on the native battery in here. So just to be clear, this is the native battery. Now look what happens when I change out the native battery. So all I'm going to do is just disconnect the battery, easy, easy. And I'm going to swap in this battery that's working just fine over here. Now if you take this battery and you put it into an, I an iPhone 10, iPhone 8, iPhone 10s, iPhone 10R, they all use the same you know, battery technology. So you could swap this battery into an iPhone 8 and the same thing would wake up, it would talk to the iPhone battery just fine. Let's swap it into this one. We know that this phone has the capability to talk to a battery because we just saw it talking to its native battery. And now let's plug in this exact same battery that we know. This is a perfectly good battery. It was just talking to that iPhone 10 over there. And let's see what happens when we boot this up. This is an example that we're walking through on this right to repair. We're walking through this to show you guys um, and it, you know, a, an example of how to make it clear why the right to repair legislation is needed, why it's important, because we're seeing more of this software locks where there are serial numbers in parts and pieces, cameras, vibrator motor, screens, the things that you plug into the logic board, the replaceable stuff. And we're seeing that they are becoming locked down. All right, I got to enter in. Passcode. And when I do that, it's thinking, thinking, thinking. Now we can see what happens when I when I boot up this phone with the same exact battery. Look at that, it just generated a message. Look at that, can you read the message? It says, this is, this is a genuine battery. Unable to verify this phone has a genuine Apple battery. Okay, that's, that's fine and I get that and I don't have any problem with the device informing cons consumers so that something might have been replaced. There's nothing wrong with that, but you can't disable function. Right, so this says, unable to verify that this phone has a genuine Apple battery, health information is not available for this battery. Maximum capacity now is unknown. So it, it knows that this battery is 100%. We just verified, this iPhone just told us that. There's nothing wrong with this battery. This is a, this is a perfectly fine working battery. And when I put it into this phone, this phone, you can see it's trying to talk to it. Whoa, 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 software lock. The battery has a serial number in the 10S. 
a read-only serial number on that battery, that if the device is now, for the first time, programmed to look for that serial number, and if it doesn't see that serial number, then guess what? Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm disabling your access to battery health. I'm not going to tell you about that anymore. Now, there's, there's a difference between the phone just reporting, hey, somebody's messed with the parts, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. But there's a difference between just reporting and disabling function. So now I no longer get to see that the capacity of this battery, I, I don't, that's missing now. It's been disabled. This, I've lost a function. And this is one tiny example of, of many, right, where there's many, many of these, and they're, they're coming more and more. For example, if I were to change a Wi-Fi chip on an iPhone 6, I can do that with no problem. But now when I get to the iPhone 7, the Wi-Fi chip is now bound to the, the memory chip, and I have to use a, a, you know, a programmer that I don't really know exactly what that programmer is doing, right? I don't like having to... To, to do that. It's becoming increasingly difficult to work around unnecessary software locks that are tying the hardware to the device so that you can't change the batteries in your remote control, you can't change the battery in your iPhone without losing function. And that's the point, right? Starting with the iPhone XS, as those age, you will not be able to change your battery without losing a function. You'll lose that battery health. It will just you know, tell you to service it, and that's not okay. All right, uh, right to repair talking point uh, number, number two. So serialization is number one, to, to let legislators know that it's a really big deal. Things like this, you know, batteries are now paired to the device and we can't change them without losing function. It's a big deal. And so are a bunch of other things. Some screens, some vibrator motors, True Tone, they are serialized, the device knows when it has been replaced, and unless you are the manufacturer, we have no ability to change those things. Um, also, things like uh, what we can't repair right now, for example, here is a home button, iPhone 7, right? So here's an iPhone 7 home button. Now, the home button on this iPhone 7 is really, really water damaged. I have no ability to just replace this piece. And this piece is really tiny. You can see how replaceable it really is physically, right? It's not a big deal for, for me to remove the home button, which is held in by some adhesive. Here it is. And I can pop it out. So here it is, this tiny piece. This tiny piece, which if I put it on my finger is about this big. This is a pretty standard kind of a part to replace. I can't replace that home button and neither can you. Neither can anybody except for the manufacturer because this home button is paired to the device itself. And it used to just be the fingerprint sensor, maybe you could make a security argument there, but this is a home button. So I lose the home button function of my iPhone 7 Plus here. I can't replace that part outside of Apple. The legislation is asking for, uh, for people like us, for you, for DIY people, for independent repair, to have access to the same tooling, not for free, but to be able to buy the access to a machine that will just say, hey, give me a new one of these and just let me pair it to the device. Just say, hey, it's a new one. Exactly the same thing they do at the Apple store when you get a new screen. It comes with a new home button and they insert a little dongle and now the new screen is paired to the device. We want to be able to fix things like a broken home button without having to throw away an entire device because this thing gets corroded or broken or damaged or torn, right? Okay, so things like home button, fingerprint sensor, face ID, these things that are all serialized is, uh, is a really big deal, all right? Uh, next is, um, is our vocabulary in the word monopoly. So why is the right to repair legislation important? It's important because of the word monopoly. The manufacturers are trying to monopolize repair. And they have deep pockets, so they're trying to convince you that they're not doing that when that's, in fact, exactly what they're doing. And so the best tools is talking point number two, monopoly. The best tool that we have is to 
change the vocabulary, change the language. So encourage people when you sit and talk with them to stop using the word authorized repair. Stop using authorized and substitute it for what it really is, manufacturer controlled. So whenever they hear that word authorized in one of these hearings, when you speak, change that to manufacturer controlled repair because that makes it more clear, right? You can go to manufacturer controlled repair or independent repair, right? Just swap that word out because it helps to show the truth, which is the manufacturers are using these arguments of, you know, safety and security and, and other such nonsense to, to kind of veil the fact that what they're really advocating for is manufacturer controlled repair, which is a monopoly. And that's exactly, that's exactly the point there. All right, um, talking point number three, talking point number three is, uh, the, the, is a response to the opposition's, uh, this year's opposition buzz phrase, which is, these people are here with a solution in search of a problem. That's what they like to say, that, that right to repair is unnecessary because it's a solution that is to a problem that doesn't exist, right? And I think they can make that point pretty well when we sit there and just talk about it. Look at all these fix these 10,000 vices. Like, look at this lady right here. You know, she was told that there's no hope for her data and look at that, I got her data, right? We, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by our success here. So I think it's really important to make it clear that while we are able to repair a lot of things, there's a lot that we can't do. There's a lot that we're restricted from. Right? That's why the serialization lock stuff is really important. But then I also want you to think about, answer it for yourself. What would you repair if it were as easy as going to a website and ordering a part? You know, it's really funny. I have, I, I've, this is unplanned here, but you, you'll die to know what's in this box. Those of you who have been, who have been following the right to repair legislation and remember uh, when we went to Nebraska, and uh, w where we first met with some of these lobbyists, you will, this is completely unplanned and completely random. I will show you what's in this box that I have ordered. I don't know if you can see it. Do, 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 do. Can you see it? Uh, I don't think I'll be able to focus it, but I'll show you. In here, I, I totally randomly bought this to take home to fix for my husband's 50th birthday our microwave, our built-in microwave, and this thing is a magnetron. I'm doing it, it's a magnetron. So the magnetron on my built-in microwave uh, quit working, so I've ordered another one. It happened to arrive today, but it's just so funny that it really was pretty easy for me to order this magnetron. I ordered the magnetron, I ordered the capacitor, the diode, and I ordered the, um, the door switches that are kind of all the possible things that could be wrong with this microwave if they really want to fix it. It was pretty easy. So my challenge for you guys would be to answer the question for yourself. What would you repair? What have you said no to lately because you, you couldn't get reliable parts? And when we thought about it, we, um, we wrote down a few things. Uh, Sunday wanted to fix her, uh, the electronics on her toaster oven that she needed some parts for that she couldn't get. We turned down a Kindle today because we were not able to get um, affordable parts that uh, we knew were going to work. Um, really, anything with a charge port. It's so many things have come in here where it's, you know, electronic device with a charge port, where charge ports get wear and tear and they break off, and they're a pretty straightforward thing to fix if you can find the, the part, right? Lots of different laptops, lots of tablets, lots of game consoles, and then other things like, uh, like, uh, uh, coffee maker, for example, and then one that is really, uh, really stood out to me from a student who's told us about how they, they had hired two or three people in the community to put them to work fixing Beats headphones. This was years ago. And they were able to go to the Beats website and order these parts for Beats headphones. When Apple bought Beats and incorporated that brand, the next day they went on to order parts, that website was taken down. So there's, there are a lot of things that we could repair. If you go over to ifixit.com, ifixit has, look at how many guides and repair manuals for 21,000 different types of devices 
there's some sort of information that people have shared together here at iFixit. And that only works if we can access parts. So it's not just phones and it's not just tractors, but we need to make the point that there are a lot of things that we could fix if we had access to the parts and information that we need. Um, let's see, what else is on here? Uh, oh, other things that we can't fix. I think this is a big one. Um, there's, a, there's an iPhone around here. I've heard this complaint a few times. Here's one where it has a crushed back glass. Now, the back glass has an Apple logo on it. What are we supposed to do about that? I'd like to be able to order Apple logo back glass from Apple and put that into the phone and give it a proper repair. But I, I can't order it from Apple. And if I generate cop, you know, counterfeit fake back glass, I can't put an Apple logo on it. And if this phone does not have an Apple logo, then the, the end user is not able to trade it in or take advantage of any of those upgrade programs. That's really unfair because if you crack the front of your phone, you can get a replacement screen. Everything's fine. You can turn it in for an upgrade. You have preserved the value of the device with repair. But if you crack it on the back, you're out of luck. Either you need to find somebody who's, who's willing to incredibly risk their business by putting counterfeit Apple logo back glass on there, that's really not a good idea, but that's what it's come to. So I'd like to make the point that I don't like as a mother being put in a position where in order for me to fix somebody's device, I'm, I have to have anything to do with counterfeit stuff where people put an Apple logo that wasn't Apple. That's not okay. And the solution is this kind of legislation to make these parts, um, parts and tools available. Um, the other thing that I think is important, talking point, software, software issues. So we need legislation that will allow end users to choose to roll back their software, and that is not supported largely across the board. Now, it's a big deal because you may have an older mobile device that you like, you're using it, and you're constantly under pressure to update the device by the manufacturer because they want you to prioritize security. Maybe there's some vulnerability or something like that. Who knows? We no longer have the right to, to say, you know what? I did update it, but I want to go back. And I understand there's a security risk. We need the freedom to be able to choose to value the longevity of our device or its long-term life or being able to pass it down. It's ours and we own it and we have the right to choose whether or not we want to prioritize closing every possible security potential loophole or not, or being able to use the device. Because a lot of these devices, when you ask them to update, there's just too much of a hardware software mismatch, which I don't know if that's by design or not, but it's putting a ton of our natural resources out of commission because we don't have the option to go back in time. And it's especially important for data especially we do a lot of data recovery, and we see thousands of unrecoverable phones because they were not able to progress to the newest iOS and the manufacturers don't allow us to, to go back. And that's a, that's a really big deal. Um, the, another thing uh, that, uh, let's see, I think on my list here, the, um, the solution in search of a problem stuff, it's important to point out that manufacturer controlled repair is really not repair at all. And you can look on my channel for when we've called around, since our expertise is Apple iPhones, uh, we've called around to ask Apple authorized service providers specifically what you can and can't do. And it's, it's, it's shocking what manufacturer controlled repair, I mean, it might, it's not even fair to call it repair at all for many cases. If you have an iPad, an iPad, these iPads can cost $1,000. If you have an iPad and you drop it and crack the screen, the uh, manufacturer controlled repair, no solution for you, no repair for you. That is crazy. So anything wrong with an iPad at all, there is no option for repair, only replacement. And the, the list is jaw dropping. 
the Apple, uh, Apple controlled repair will not change charge ports and headphone jacks and cameras. They will not even put a new battery in a phone when the phone has a dead battery because, yeah, well, we don't know it actually needs a, a new battery. It's too dead to even ask it, so forget it, throw that phone away. They, and you can see this time and time again on my channel where Apple said no, they will not even put a battery in a phone. It's only thing wrong with it is a bad charge port just so that somebody can get back their precious pictures from the trip they just went on. The, the manufacturer controlled repair is not repair at all. Manufacturer controlled repair is, a, is, the, is the Seinfeld soup Nazi, no repair for you. And that message needs to be clear that it's not, there's not, this is not a solution in search of a problem. In fact, I'd argue that the opposition is, uh, is, is a whole lot of, it's really a whole lot of opposition in search of real issues because they make these arguments that haven't proven to be true. While we are restricted from being able to do a lot of the repairs that we'd like to do and we'd like to be able to do more, the facts are that many of us are fixing devices really well in volume. I mean, millions of phones are being fixed. We have not seen these kinds of potential problems that, that, that they're talking about, right? So they're constantly arguing about safety and security, right? I mean, if you think about like, who got in trouble for security this year? Uh, wasn't that the, uh, the guy that works at Apple? The Apple, the Apple controlled guy <laughs> was in trouble for, you know, texting nudes around, right? So there's bad people everywhere. But we, we have been living with access to a lot of information. It's not as much as we want, and it's getting more and more whittled down with these software locks. But there hasn't been any of these... <laughs> you know, massive mecca for hackers, batteries catching on fire and killing people and stuff like that. There's not a big epidemic of the, f the fear mongering stuff. So I think the opposition is really a, a whole lot of uh, op opposition arguments that are really in search of an issue to argue about because those issues don't really seem to exist. All right. Um, I think the, the last thing is that uh, we, need, we need you. So one of the other arguments that we're hearing a lot is the like, you know, people here stand to profit a lot. Mm, let's really think about that. Who stands to profit a lot from manufacturer controlled repair? When the manufacturer limits, reduces, and controls your repairable options to pretty much nothing, that forces you to buy a new device. So if you follow the money, it's going to the manufacturers. And I think it's a really important statement for you to make as a DIY enthusiast. Maybe somebody that's not a repair shop owner, right? Somebody who's like, hey, I just want to be able to change my battery without losing my battery health stuff. Why do I have to give up a function in order to change my own battery, right? Make those points as, as individuals. And I think that that will, will uh, really be strong. Come out and show up and make a lot of bodies there and make a lot of noise. And I, I think that's, uh, that's really important. At the public hearings, there's always a testimony time limit. So unlike this sort of freestyle thing that, that, that I've done here, uh, you're going to have one minute or three minutes. So you need to write it out, what you're going to say. But then once you write it out, throw it away and speak from the heart. Tell your own story. Everybody likes repair anecdotes. It gets boring hearing the same stuff again and again. So personalize it. Go to your own state's hearings and show up. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to testify. It's a really fun part of being an American, especially in such a politically divided climate. It's really fun to go and have your voice heard because it's just so overwhelmingly clear that in this climate, there's limited resources. In this world that we're living in, we have to do a better job of making things last longer. We can't just throw things away and get a new one. We, we have to fix, and, uh, and that's the right thing to do. So let me check over and see um, if there's any important questions to answer. Let's see. Xbox One repair shop. What? Let's see. Right to repair is designed for the end user, the consumer to repair, not third party.
companies. That is true. Um, right, if you buy a laptop with Windows installed on it, you have the freedom to remove the operating system and replace it with Linux. Phones bring being PC should give users the freedom to do the same. Um, yep, yeah, let's see. Uh, I really appreciate you guys hanging in here and watching this all the way to the end. Um, I think this is really important. And also, if you hear of in your own home state a, you know, hey, there's a public hearing, they get scheduled and then changed constantly. So that, that makes it really, really tough. So if you hear in your state, hey, it looks like there's a public hearing this Friday, then let me know. You can send a message to info at ipadrehab.com or tell us on our live chat and we'll see that. And then I will go and make a post on my YouTube community page to try to spread the word a little bit and I'll encourage Lewis to do the same. And let's see, I think that that is probably it. So I'm really sad that I'm not gonna be able to make it over to Maine tomorrow and that I miss being able to go to Washington. So I hope that you guys can take it to heart and really focus on hammering this idea of serialization software lock as being really dangerous and that it's, it's already happening. It's, it doesn't take very much to envision a world where the screen itself can't be replaced because it has a serial number that is read only. That's already happened to batteries, the second most common repair for the 10S. The battery already has been serialized. We cannot replace it without losing some function. That's a really dangerous precedent, and it's been set. Make that crystal clear for everybody. Focus on what you can't repair that you'd like to be able to repair, not just tell all the things you can do. Focus on what you are capable of repairing from your track record that you can't because you can't get parts and information that you need. Read the bill. Make sure you understand the wording of the bill. Maybe you don't agree with the bill. Maybe you think it's too broad. Maybe you think it's too tight. Just let your, speak to the actual bill so that you, you, you give them something to work with, right? Focus on those opposition arguments and make it clear it's manufacturer controlled repair. This is a monopoly. All we're doing is trying to prevent a monopoly on repair. Monopolies are inherently unfair and we need you. We need you. The end users, repair shops, we need you to show up for your home state because at the end of the day, those representatives want to represent and they want to speak for the people that voted them in office. That's you. So it's got to be local. Show up and be heard and let me know how it goes. All right, that's going to be it for this stream. Good luck. <laughs>